So here we are uh, introducing Rick Kinsbrunner of Jaconda Vineyard and he's just been presented by me with his winemaker award being one of the nine groundbreaking winemakers we've found for this latest edition of Wine Behind the Label. So I'd just like to ask Rick a few questions if I may. Uh, Rick, um, when did you first get into wine? How did you first? About 1970. Three to four when I was an engineer and friends introduced me to good red wines and I was instantly fascinated and that was uh, the nail in the coffin for the engineering days one way or another within a couple of years anyway. I loved engineering but I loved wine even more. Okay and you decided to buy a vineyard or you rented no, a vineyard? No, or? no, no, not at all. I decided to, I was relatively young in those days, I decided to travel overseas, leave my job, travel overseas and to finance it in order so to be interesting to just pick up part-time jobs in wineries and I started heading um, west, I went to New Zealand first and did a vintage job there and then California was the next logical destination so I went to California and I got a vintage shop there which then continued on and off for many years and I also worked in a couple of other wineries in, in California, I travelled to France, I worked two stars in Bordeaux um, and so I was never back to engineering by that stage. I studied a little bit in Davis to catch up on a few things that I needed to know that I didn't learn in engineering. Then, to make a long story short, came back to Australia to work at Brown Brothers as assistant winemaker and very quickly fell in love with the region where I am now, Beechworth. This just really fascinated me. And one thing was Brown Brothers had it made some wine in the 70s and earlier from that region and I always thought that was their best wine. That, other than really loving personally the area, that also helped make up my mind. One day people ask me, how did you select such a good site? And I tell them, which is absolutely the truth, I drove past one day and I saw a for sale sign and I bought the land. Right. That was 1981 by then. Yeah. I mean so one of my favourite winemakers, not Beatrice in Bendigo, was Stuart Anderson. Yeah. I don't know no. whether you knew him or yeah, he was a, you know, well, I was, he was one of the very first wave of boutique wine, yeah. wineries in Australia, and I was probably the, one of the very first or the second. Yeah. Yeah, so I knew Stuart, I know Stuart, so. And so you, you bought this winery and... No, I didn't buy a winery, didn't buy it. it was vacant land. Just vacant land. A small house, nothing else. Yeah, and so you, you planted vines and... I proceeded to plant vines in 82. I made my first small vintage in the, in the, basically in the garage in 85. You were the first garagist then. Yeah. <laughs> I probably was the first garagist in Australia. <laughs> and um, went from there, planted more vines slowly, built a new winery eventually. I moved into the new winery in about 91. So from 85 to 91 I was totally in a very small crowded garage. A true garagist though, and I don't think anybody had heard the term in those days. I have only just been starting in Bordeaux as well. Yeah. So it and, went from there. Uh, I know I did visit you uh, some time ago. I'm trying to remember whether it was 84 or 94 when I visited you. I'd say uh, I wasn't in the small garage then. Mm, was no, I? I think you were in a larger, yeah, a larger it was winery. Yeah, long in my new winery, 94 that would have been. Yeah, yeah. yeah I remember and it was a fair while ago, but I don't think it was in 94. Right, I know that you had some of your wines found its way to England. Uh, I remember Jasper Morris talking about it, and I remember yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you did some, had some wine. Did you have some wines down in that place in Devon, in Doddiscombe Lee? Oh, yeah. Uh, there was yeah, a really, the Nobody Inn. The Nobody Inn, yes. Actually, I think, I'm trying to remember the second How did your wine find its way there? <laughs> oh, they, maybe it was Adam Bancroft at the time. Yeah. Do you know that name? Adam yes, Bancroft? yes, I do, of course. I think he was the first. Important. We had Robin Yap also for a little while. Yeah. But um, it went well with Robin Yap, but it wasn't quite really his cup of tea because he's a real grown man. Yes. So then it came to Jasper Morris. Yeah. And it basically stayed in that lineage ever since. So it's Adam Brancroft until he passed away, in fact. And then uh, I guess, yeah, I think Adam went. Oh, I can't remember now which was which. Anyway, those three. Hmm. And since those early days, how have you developed? How, how have you felt? I haven't changed very much, you know. For example, at the very, very start, I used cultivated yeast. 
Yeah. I really got my inspiration from California, and from some of these guys who were right beside us. John Williams and, yes. David, and David Ramey we were all young guys and working together. Those They were yeah. doing their stage at, at various wineries around the place at the same time when I was there. So, and we all got a bit of inspiration together. So my real inspiration came from California. John Consgard is Consgard's yes, another, yes, well, another very good friend of mine. Yeah. And um, so we kind of learned a lot of things together. And then especially when David Romy worked at Simi, I did a, vintage, a couple of vintages there when he was assistant winemaker. And there's a lot of experimentation going on there, which was really nice. So, but surprisingly, my methods have changed very little. The, the one big change would be the very first couple of years I used inoculated yeast just yes. to be safe, but I very quickly found that the native yeast was perfectly good and better. So then I went to native yeast, but things have been very much the same ever since then. It's wines that have little or no filtration, no filtrations these days, and natural yeast, natural malolactic bacteria, 100% malolactic, all fermented in, I'm talking about Chardonnay in this case, yes. all fermented in small barrels. Um, open top fermenters for the reds and um, nothing much has changed it's, it's been fine tuned you could say sure uh, how do you see the future what do you see do you see any developments in, in any way do you um, think of we, we have made one big change are you, in, in, you know that, that's to make an underground a proper underground cave for maturation yes that's been the one single biggest change that's not a real change it's an improvement but n- now my wine's rest in barrel in, you know two years in a cool humid condition and constant temperature. Um, so that's been one big move forward in quality. How else do I see it change? No matter of fine tuning, getting smarter, getting smarter in the vineyard, getting smarter in the winery. Um, a couple of interesting things from your point of view is that I don't make Cabernet Sauvignon or Roussan anymore. Mm-hmm. So, and that's a change because I want to do less, I want to do it better. Yes. And also, the market has got tougher, you know, it's harder to sell wine. So, really, I think... Well, I have to say that the Chardonnay I've just tasted was really quite outstanding. We uh, have got better in Chardonnay, thanks to tuning up the techniques and the mm. underground cave. Yeah. But I, I, I don't do Cabernet Sauvignon anymore, and I don't do Roussain anymore. Okay. And, you know, my son is there, I want to think about handing it on a bit more compact for the next generation. Yes. Um, is, is he years. helping you in the, vine- in the vineyards now? Is he helping you in the winery? Beg your pardon? Is your son helping you? Yeah, yeah, he works uh, full time with me. Yeah. And in fact, for the next four or five months, I'll be in France and he'll be doing everything. So. Right. Um, so, yeah, there's the change of coming, you know, to handle the next generation. I'm fortunate that I've got a family that's interested in carrying on. I know, yes. you know, my older son is passionate about wine. The other one is a bit young, he's not so interested at the moment. Um, Otherwise, we fine-tune everything from time to time. I try. I'm slowly... We've always been a... a always, I think we call it a viticulture raisonné in, in French. It's not exactly organic, but it's close to organic. Yes. We could look for an organic certification down the track, maybe. Um, well, I think if the wines are good, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't seem to be a factor that I need to do at the moment. Mm. But that, that could be one thing to change. Okay. Oh, and, and, and the other... Interesting thing for you is probably, though I've dropped Cabernet Sauvignon and, and um, Roussan, I now make Nebbiolo, which has always been, oh, yeah. Barolo has always been a bit yeah. of a passion of, my, of mine since the 70s, and yeah. eventually... So you're going to have Beechwood Barolo, are you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I have been making some Nebbiolo since uh, 2008, Yes. but in another vineyard, which I've sold a share of that, my vineyard in my share in that vineyard mm. and planted it, another vineyard not on my property the other side of Beechworth about 10k away yeah. in what I consider will be a really excellent site for heavy island. and we've made the first little bit of that this year yeah. and it looks potentially outstanding. So you haven't released any none have been bottled yet to be on heavy island. I've released um, four vintages from the original vineyard which yes. I don't have any more but the 15 is the first one from the new one and it's resting right. in barrel. Okay, well, we'll, and, and we'll look see, forward to tasting see, that and yeah, having we'll a look see at some that. results in a few years. Okay. All so, right, uh, Rick, thanks very much. Um, good luck with what you're doing. Hope everything goes well. And once again, the winemaker, groundbreaking winemaker award, well deserved. And uh, 
more power to your elbow for many years to come. Thanks, Harold. Hi, everyone. I'm sure you found that a really fascinating uh, interview with Rick Kintzbrunner. Just a little postscript. Um, you will notice, or you will note, during that interview, he did say that he's no longer making Cabernet Sauvignon or Roussanne. And this will be reflected in our update of his entry in Wine Behind the Label for the next edition. And as soon as this is uh, put into place, our members will be able to get this update before the 10th edition is actually published. So keep a lookout for this, and uh, we hope you've enjoyed that particular interview.